All right, well, let's get started. Um, I'm Sarah Hanawald, the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development and New Programs here at One School House. And I have today with me a guest who um, I'm getting to know pretty well, who y'all have seen on here before as well. So Kareem Dadini, welcome. Can you just tell everybody a little bit about you and what you do here, and then we'll get started? Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me today. Hi, everyone. I'm Kareem. I'm the Assistant Head for Teaching and Learning, so I oversee our student program. Great, thank you so much. So as we do, I'm gonna just let y'all know a little bit about what's going on at One Schoolhouse right now. And we welcome questions at any point if you'll use the Q&A to ask those, unless it's something that um, you, know, you need to, to do more privately, you can also message me with those. So on our blog, I published an extract of our blog on the listserv that we are that we host right now for academic leaders. And Kareen, you and Tracy York, your colleague wrote really eloquently about supporting students of color and really maintaining that balance of what can we do right now for the students we have with us as we think about our programs and how we want our programs to grow. So I really thank you for those words of wisdom. And I know that there, you've gotten a lot of feedback on that already. So good job. Um, next week's webinar, we're gonna look at building better understandings with parents and how we can do that. So because I have Corrine here and she is the assistant head of school for teaching and learning, I'm not going to tell everybody about our student courses, but Corrine, we are running into um, the last days for registering for student courses, aren't we? And we are, Sarah. So as many of you know, we start school in just a couple of weeks and many courses are getting full. So if you are working with students and are trying to resolve scheduling com conflicts or you have families who have um, specific requests for certain types of courses that maybe aren't in your catalog, or as people respond differently to the Delta variant, if you suddenly have families who are unprepared to send their children back to school in person, we are here for you. So um, please do reach out. Um, as, as you might recall, last year we decided to add the entire core curriculum to our catalog, which in normal years we do not do. Um, but if you have a student who needs all of their classes online, don't put that burden on your teachers. Send those kids to us. Um, we will be your partner in that and make sure the child has a good and safe year that works for both you, your teachers, who you don't want having to Zoom them in, and, um, and for the families. I know that that option has been something that has really helped schools feel both relieved and like they're maintaining a relationship that's so important to them. Yeah. So thank you for, I know that took a lot of work, Karine, so thank you. <laughs> they're great courses. It's been fun to build the core. <laughs> right, so I'm glad. So every week we ask our Pulse survey, and if you haven't had a chance to participate yet, I'm sure Sienna's gonna drop it, the link in the chat and we'd welcome your comments. And this week we asked, what identity courses have you always wanted to build and offer to your students? And with this kind of question, the feedback needs to be text and participatory. So we don't have a graph to show you, but we've got some really interesting quotes. And I'm going to read some of these out loud, just because I know the print is tiny and I have my contacts in so I can read it. <laughs> so I'll share that with you. Um, Intro to Ethic Studies, Ethnic Studies, a course on identity, pluralism and tolerance. Black to the Future, Pan-African visions of the future in music, literature, fashion and art. Introduction to Cultural Anthropology, Jewish Folklore and Ethnology. And then this one's a little bit longer. We have two indigenous tribes in our area and a measurable percentage of our students from these tribes. We are building a full quarter of study into our sixth grade local history class for the first time. We would like to offer a semester elective to our upper school students. And then the next one is longer as well. A genre-based literature course centered on the experiences of identity, a cross-departmental history science class about not white guys in STEM that examines the hidden help in the European laboratory and the squashed history of discovery in not European centric math and science. 
And then the last one is Introduction to Middle East Studies. So again, if, you, if these are courses that you're building at your school, we would love to hear more and maybe continue the conversation on the listserv as well. I know that there has been a lot of curiosity about these. So I'm gonna stop sharing so that Karine and I can see each other a little bit better. And so Karine, thank you so much for, I know it's an incredibly busy time and I'm really glad to have you here because your blog post this week focused on something that is challenging on campus to talk about for some people, and yet it's incredibly important in the lives of our communities. So what we're doing is acknowledging how our schools may be falling short for some students. That's a hard conversation to have, even just to begin. So can you just tell me how, when you got started, tell me about the title of this webinar, for example. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. The title of this webinar is from a student, actually, and um, the origin of this work at one schoolhouse is the students. So um, we had a student last year who had taken one of our identity courses and she dedicated her senior thesis at her school to the one schoolhouse teacher who had taught the course. And she specifically said that without the course, she wouldn't have known that she wasn't an island of one. And she wouldn't have known that this was really her passion and what she wanted to study in college. So. The title of her senior thesis was Teach About Me Too. So, you know, Corrine, you told me a little bit about this before when we were planning the webinar, and somehow I missed until this moment that it wasn't a paper that she wrote for the course, but it was her senior thesis back at her school. Yes, yes, it was a project she had to do at her school. Um, where I don't, I don't know the whole scope of the project, but I know that at that particular school, they're a longstanding member of the consortium and it is a keystone project that the students complete as part of their graduation requirement. Wow, and so she just dedicated that to her one schoolhouse teacher for her identity course. That's, wow, that's one of those you keep forever when you're a teacher, one of those <laughs> moments, like why do I do what I do? And it just stays in your heart that way. I love it. Um, so how did One Schoolhouse decide to begin building identity courses as part of the academic program? What led to this? Well, we listened to our schools. You all know this, every year we come out with questions around what courses do you want us to teach? And we also listened to our students. So what are their needs in their courses? What are our teachers doing well? And where are places where our teachers seem to be falling short in meeting student needs. So this is one of those intersections of feedback from different areas. Um, and our first identity course that we built was actually gender identity in the United States. And its origins were particular to our formation as the online school for girls and the fact that we have a lot of girls schools in our consortium. And we knew that our schools look to us to lead on difficult issues and how to roll out change in your community. So um, following the lead of Mount Holyoke, we took on what does it mean to be an inclusive girls school? And um, we wanted, we know that, that it's a hard question for schools. It was a hard question at the time. And we wanted to model what kind of practices create a sense of belonging in your community. And there were multiple answers to that particular question with regards to gender identity. But one of the answers was, you have a place in your curriculum that centers identity. And so that was the origin of these identity courses. So that there is that home base at home place where my identity is the center. That's student. right. We really wanted to push against um, the white heteronormative and the experience that for school, for groups within schools who may feel marginalized, just because we address the marginalization doesn't mean that we center their identities. And so that was the origin of the work. Wow. So that was an inspired decision. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about how the students in those courses responded to the opportunity to take the classes, especially in those early days. You know, <laughs> it's interesting, Sarah, because it's, it's exceptional, not just because the courses are good. So, you know, we like to say all our courses are good, but this, this responds to an exceptional need. And so One Schoolhouse has always 
specialized in kind of connecting students who felt like they were an island of one or the only at their school. So those of you who've been with us for a while have probably heard Brad or me tell the story that students who are good at math are often accelerated in their school. So you may have a 10th grader who's in an 11th or a 12th grade dominated class and they often feel really alone because there's a big difference between a 10th grader and a 12th grader. Um, and so they need the challenge. They're in the right place academically, but they, they still kind of feel isolated at their school. And so some of the work is really around creating that kind of community. And, um, and it, one of the fun stories uh, a few years after we were founded was that, a group of, I think it was four girls were at orientation at Harvard and realized they'd all been in the same multivariable calculus class at one schoolhouse. <laughs> and so, you know, they'd come from disparate parts of the country and they didn't know each other well enough to know where they were all going to college. And then they got there and they had this like instant sense of community that we've been together, we've, we've crossed a bridge together. You know, I really like that because when you think about that isolation, it's not strictly academic, right? Because these kids are, they're placed appropriately by their schools in an accelerated program. They are quite likely, if they're very talented, to be doing very well in an accelerated course. And so that's kind of a, a twice, you know, I am younger than everybody else and I seem to be more adept at the material and that can be really socially isolating. So thinking about being in with other kids who, who are ready to work at my pace and, and having that experience before they get to college because when they get to college, there will no matter where they go, um, and that's a great story, they are gonna meet up with other students who are just as capable as they are. And it's probably a real benefit if that doesn't happen the first time. That's there. right. Well, and the other thing that's really compelling about it, Sarah, is that in turn, they actually feel more understood by their school. Ooh. Because if the school has been able to say, this is a place where you're going to experience belonging, maybe beyond what you've had here in our environment, then that student feels like my school knows me, my school is caring for me by giving me this option. Okay, so then for the administrators, the academic leaders, did you have any tell you that they were um, concerned about recommending courses to students? For example, in the math situation, did academic leaders or maybe the math department leaders feel vulnerable talking about, well, we don't have the capacity to teach at that level, or maybe we only have two students who are ready for this class. And if we, if we have the class with only two students, we're gonna have to really increased class size for students who are struggling. I mean, that's got to feel really vulnerable. Actually, it's not that they didn't have the capacity. There were definitely teachers at the school who could teach multivariable calculus okay. or linear algebra. It's that they would have been super small classes, right? And most schools were down to two or three kids who need these classes by the time they're a junior or a senior. And so you've got kids who are younger than their classmates as they come through. And at some point, they're just this little island. Um, and so they need the community of other kids who, you know, we're, we're talking about our math example here because it's a little easier to get to this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they need the kids who will like live and breathe partial differential equations or whatever they're working on, right? Um, that's their community. That's where they want to be. And so, no, I don't think it's hard to recommend to a child or a family, here, take this other option for math. Like here, okay. take linear algebra as a senior. That's a first or second year college course easily. So <laughs> this is where we can turn to, how does this apply then? to what yeah. we're talking about in these identity courses. So, so then let's think about learning from that experience and then considering maybe the Asian identity course. Um, if someone feels like bringing that up to a student, maybe they're worried that it will seem like they're making assumptions about that student not fitting in well at school. Um, one of the things that comes to mind right 
uh, for me is, well, how do you know if you don't ask, right? You as the administrator have a lot of power in these kids' lives and making yourself vulnerable enough to have the conversation is an act of courage right there. Yeah, it's brave. It's definitely brave. And it's the difference between what we've privileged as advanced and what we say then is extra. And that might seem like a nuance when you're talking about a junior or a senior schedule, but it's really impactful for the kids. Um, so somehow it's harder for us to say that your Latinx identity is advanced or that that experience is valuable or unique or something that we want to elevate. Um, and studying it is in fact rigorous and advanced coursework. That's harder for us as school administrators sometimes to say than to say linear algebra is advanced coursework. And this is part of the, you know, when, when we look at the practices that degrade inclusivity in schools, one of them is this core curriculum objectivity <laughs> that makes students feel like aspects of their identity or interests are valued less or marginalized. You know, just last week, um, we were discussing the fact that students who traverse cultures are carrying an extra cognitive load at all times, and that that's not always acknowledged, that they are doing more cognitive processing just to get through um, what for someone else might be a normal school day, and we should honor that more. That's so true. It's, Sarah, I think um, there's a lot of us who are middle-aged white administrators in schools and we care deeply for kids and we want them to feel safe enough to grow. And yet it's difficult for us to walk in another's shoes sometimes. So as you know, I always bring party favors. <laughs> so, um, for those of you who haven't read this in a long time, or if you've never read it, it's required reading. Um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed is seminal literature in this work and it's ageless. Um, and it will really help you understand the history of where we have been and where we are going as schools. Um, so put this on your list. The other party favors I'm bringing for you are, for those of you who build empathy through memoir or fiction. This one's called A Mind Spread Out on the Ground, and um, it's a Native American author, and she tells anecdotes from her childhood of growing up in different types of schools and coming to school from the res, and um, I think I recommend this one in particular if you are someone like me who really needs to understand a child's experience by walking in their shoes daily. So this one can really help. And then the last one, for those of you who are looking for something that's a little more of an intellectual read, um, My Grandmother's Hands is, uh, it alternates a little bit between science and social science, but it really gives you the history of racialized trauma and the epigenetics of race. And so um, for those of you who are like me and are trying to um, walk the talk of we do the best we can until we know better and when we know better, we do better. Those are some books to add to your, you know, reading in your free time in September. Great, thank you. Well, and um, you and I have talked about whether or not audiobooks are the right way. And for some people that might be another way if you've got a commute, audiobooks are great. Um, so thank you for sharing this. And I really like that you say it that way. You always bring party favors because you do, you always get us more to read. So that's fantastic and I appreciate it. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about more, more about the courses that we're offering? What are we gonna offer? And I wanna remind everybody, we've got a question in the chat and we'll definitely get to that. But if you've got a question, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A. We welcome your questions. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so this year we have um, four identity courses, the gender course, which we've already mentioned. And then we have Asian identity in the United States, Black identity in the United States, and Latinx identity in the United States. And the courses, I think what's fun for me about watching the development and then the the facilitation of these courses that we have been intentional about hiring teachers who are 
intellectual experts in the field, but also bring some level of personal experience to the work. And so the students who come to the class, they find intellectual rigor in what they're studying, both historically and in real time. And so the courses tackle the history of movements as well as the lived experience in present day. But there's also, as is true in all of our courses, a lot of space for exploration into deeper dives, particular topics that are of interest to you, and the opportunity to go on. They're all fall courses, so and the opportunity in the spring to go on and um, take one of our three seminars to take a real deep semester long dive into a topic of interest. So, um, do you find that people really appreciate that flexibility? Oh, of course. I mean, there's tons of research around project-based learning and the value of giving students the chance to center their own interests and then learn the, nat the, the natural skills that are discipline-specific or interdisciplinary that lift up the rigor of what they're studying. And so that's what the teachers do in these courses. Great, thank you. And Thinking about the teachers, you mentioned um, some of the criteria when you're recruiting teachers, but what's the experience of designing the courses like for the teachers? Well, as our pulse shows this week, schools know that they have teachers who want to teach these classes and oftentimes there's just not room in the schedule, right? If, if you've got to teach if I've got to teach AP biology and AP chemistry, I don't have time to build a course on the epigenetics of race, even though I'm fascinated and would love to do that with my history colleague up the, up the hallway. And so, so there's the desire, there's the expertise amongst your faculty often, and there's just not the bandwidth within the schedule to make it happen in your school. Or maybe there's not enough students at your school who could fill that hole course to make it financially worth offering. And, you know, that's a question we have to ask. So, um, so one thing that's super fun when, when we at One Schoolhouse get to hire teachers to develop courses like this, they're often things they've been thinking about for a long time and just haven't been able to teach. Maybe there's a few units they've worked into what they do teach, but they haven't been able to build a course around the particular competencies of each of these courses. So oftentimes we're getting people who are super passionate and knowledgeable and know how important and impactful this type of course could be for students if we could get it to them. So they're also just really excited to be able to teach it on a platform with such wide reach. You know, you just used a key phrase too, if we can get it to them or get them to it. And I'm thinking about my time as an academic dean and the schedule and running the schedule and figuring out how many seniors were going to not get an elective with this version and making choices. And, and I think about students who really want to take these courses who are taking this language and playing this instrument and have this requirement because they're interested in a college that expects a certain course that it just gets hard and our courses are asynchronous and they fit and they work with that, don't they? Absolutely. And I don't think one of the greatest gifts you can give a child in high school is sending them off to college, knowing what their passions are. And as you just mentioned, students are busier and busier doing what they think is expected of them in order to get into a good college and be successful. And then they get to college and they're like, who do I want to be? What do I love? And so they've been so good at doing school and meeting all these expectations. Maybe they haven't taken the time to explore these passions and being able to do that, even just for one small semester elective in high school can really chart a direction for them going forward. I think that's so important. Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. I'm gonna ask you the, the first one. They did come in the chat and I'm happy to do that. But folks, if you'd use the Q and A, there's just less of a chance that I'll miss it. Um, but so how is one schoolhouse doing this work that it in our courses that are not identity courses? So I think what this person's wondering is, are you also thinking about equity and identity in courses that are not specifically for that? Absolutely. Um, 
We are on a three-year arc in our DEI initiative, and there was a little bit about this in my blog this week. But one of the things that I've long been worried about is that schools have DEI initiatives, and they are set up to serve the school community long term. So designing backwards from what's most what are the most important outcomes. But you've got students and families of color in your schools right now. And so that's something that we tackled at one schoolhouse head on was we said, we are going to start this work by centering identity in all of our classes. And the research around how to create belonging aligns with a lot of our major pedagogical decisions. For example, competency-based learning allows students to explore their own interests more. Personalized learning provides pathway choice. Um, application to the real world, which has been one of our pillars since we were founded, is essential to giving students the opportunity to see themselves in the curriculum and apply what they're learning to what matters most to them. So we make intentional choices in every single one of our classes where students get to see themselves in the curriculum and do the thing, do the application of that course of study that's most relevant to them. That's great. So another question concerns pushback in the current political environment, and you address that as well, right? And so are our courses, are you hearing from folks who are enrolling students in courses that this is a way for them to maybe offer something that states are considering banning and whether or not independent schools are um, subject to those bans or, I guess, it depends on the state and the school and all of those things. But is that a conversation or a consideration that you've been having? Of course, and the right thing to do, my grandpa used to always say, the right thing to do is always the right thing to do. And the right thing for us to do is to be a partner in innovation to our schools. And that means that we need to help our schools expand their curriculums. So wherever a school is in terms of what it can and can't offer on campus, one schoolhouse has always been the place to extend that course catalog in a way that hopefully feels relatively easy. And so there are going to be families in every school who are going to be really uncomfortable with the, the school's DEI initiative, or maybe to the point where the DEI initiative is actually getting suppressed a little bit by the families. There's also going to be families of color in those schools who want their children to have access to different types of courses. And so regardless of where a school is, we are a safe partner. And you know, schools are making the choices for the most part about what courses their students enroll with us. Um, and I love the fact that a student who's out of school that doesn't have a lot going on for DEI can still graduate from that school feeling like they really had a rigorous, inclusive experience because of the school's online partner. You know, I want to go back to something that you said earlier and in writing as well, which is that there are students who need these courses right now, and they can't wait for dust to settle in other ways or initiatives because our schools do change slowly. And that is usually a good thing, right, that we don't make rapid pivots um, unless we're unless we really have to. Of course, we all just did <laughs> last year. It was really <laughs> have to I say that, like we don't usually pivot really fast, but by golly, we did. Um, that being said, you know, as a school works through its processes, you know, there are students who, who will miss out if you don't offer them something between now and then. So. Thank you for sharing that. I wanna thank you so much for coming on today and sharing not just that we have these courses, but really the thinking behind the why of why we have these courses. And I think that's super helpful to those who are watching this. And I really wanna just acknowledge that this is brave for administrators to, to broach these conversations at school if you haven't done so already. So thank you. Absolutely, Sarah. And um, you know, I would welcome feedback if anyone heard anything today that they found troubling or offensive. This is a journey for all of us. And, you know, we're trying to be really mindful of not credentialing or outwoking or whatever those expressions are, rushing to prove that we're not racist. 
we're all in this work together and we're trying to make a more equitable future for our children. So um, any feedback that you all have for us, um, we are always open to it. And you can find our email on the website. You can reach me directly at help at oneschoolhouse.org. Well, thank you so much. And I'm really grateful to work with you. So thank you. Likewise, Sarah. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye, everyone.